Hello, my name is Peter Smith, and today I want to talk a little bit about size bias in larval brood attention from pavement ant workers. You can see these pavement ants here, and I'm basically looking at how they are attending to their brood when the brood is of a different size. As far as study system goes, my model organism was the pavement ant, also known as Tetramorium caspitum. Um, this is actually more of a European variety. In North America, it might be known as Tetramorium immigrans, but um, that's going beyond the scope of my experiment here. You can see from the literature, here are some key morphological details to look for. You can clearly see similarities between their literature ant and my ant on the right. Um, this is just the sterile female worker cast, but that's all I ever saw. Um, I think higher cast larvae are kept deeper in the nest. So let's point out some details here. It might be easier to count on my um, ant that you see on the right. They have 12 segments to their antennae. You can pause the video and count if you want, but trust me, they're 12. They also have these longitudinal grooves all throughout the body. Um, but some more obvious things here, C, they labeled C, these spines, these propodial spines are very obvious, as well as this waist segment called the petiole is made of these two distinctively shaped pieces um, and on this piece, they have this little notch called the anteroventral tooth. Um, the one difference you might see is the stinger, um, but then I would point out, mine definitely do have stingers, I observed this, but they are retractable. So um, in this image on the right, it's just retracted inside of the abdomen. So that's how I identified my um, organism of study, my subject. Um, and then this is not to scale, but um, these notches mark a millimeter, so that gives you a sense. There were two larvae of different sizes. There was a 2.5 millimeter larvae that I would be using. That was the small larvae and the large larvae were around five millimeters in size. So I wanted to look at how the adults were reacting, behaving, and tending to the larvae of different sizes. Um, that requires some signals that the larvae might be sending that these worker, nurse workers pick up on. And there are these six factors that this paper outlined um, and they're very difficult to measure but I'm basically going to make, based on some, some decent literature, that a lot of these factors may not be so important, might be either controlled for, or um, not, maybe the workers aren't so sensitive to. And the main thing to focus on would be the developmental stage, which would kind of correlate a little more to the size and the nutritional necessity um, as to why the workers might be, my hypothesis is essentially they're going to pr prefer the larger of the two sizes. So we know that the adults are of the Tetramorium genus, and either Caspidum or Immigrant species. Um, but what about the larvae? It is known that some ants will be slave makers and steal the brood of other species of ants and use them as slaves. Um, but Tetramorium is not one of them. So it's almost certain that the grubs I'm seeing are larvae of the Tetramorium Caspidum species. Um, when it comes to the cast, now this is one assumption I made that is completely wrong. I later found this out, but for the sake of describing my experimental process, I was under the impression that the small larvae would just needed to grow into the larger ones. Um, that was a little more of a developmental thing. It turns out they're actually different casts, but the logic here is still sound that this paper used fire ants, but they were kind of arguing it as a general kind of um, trend you will see among all ants, which is true, all ants are very organizational with their brood. They will put like brood item with like brood item and they will segregate them. You know, eggs from larvae, from pupa, along with many ants will separate their casts. And I thought my ants would do the same thing. So I thought any larvae predetermined to be of a higher cast or a different cast would be in a different chamber. Um, that's not true. One thing I was correct about, um, because I was seeing these larger larvae that were much larger, right? Five millimeters versus three. I took that to mean they are of the reproductive cast. You have sterile female workers, as you saw the adults of, but you also have reproductive. Reproductive females are future queens. Reproductive males are those that will mate with queens to help her establish a colony elsewhere. Um, I have no strong evidence as to why I only have one. Um, mostly it has to do with kind of the size. They can maximize about a meter, a square meter, um, but they can be below the surface as well, and I have no way of checking whether or not there are multiple colonies as far as subterranean tunnels go, but I have no reason to believe there's any more than one colony. Um, 
when it comes to paternity, right? That involves the relatedness, the kinship of the colony. Um, but I don't think I have to worry about that from the larvae perspective because it's very rare for a tetramorium to have more than one queen ant in the colony. They're monogamous, so they will almost always have one queen. And when it comes to that reproductive cast, they can be, right, male or female, as I just said. Um, but these authors found that anytime they would find a tetramorium case venom nest and they found reproductive larvae, they did, I guess, the genetic analysis and they found there was never about 50-50. It was always um, maybe as much as 12 to 1. It was predominantly one sex over the other, either, mo either mostly male or mostly female. But um, that is the, because it's so uneven in that distribution, I'm thinking that the workers wouldn't be as sensitive to the sex, even though it can be different. Um, so that leaves the developmental stage. And so basically I'm thinking that the larvae, which are larger, um, are more developed, they require a lot more care because they need more frequent and longer feeding times, as well as maybe more effort to carry them. Um, there's even some papers about how the larvae can secrete some fluid that the workers will consume. And it, the larger larvae are likely gonna have greater volumes of that fluid. So again, another reason why you might prefer the large larvae. So for those reasons, and as I described before, but let's state it formally, my hypothesis is that pavement ant workers are going to be biased towards the larger five millimeter larvae, and they will give more attendance to the larger larvae than the two and a half millimeter larvae. So let's go into the methods. How did I test this? Well, I would collect 10 of those adult sterile female worker ants and I would collect them using this aspirator. You can suck them up in a vacuum. Um, it's much more likely to keep them alive than using tweezers, they're so small, it'd be very easy to crush. So that's what I used. I would collect 10 of them and put them in this arena. This arena consists of a petri dish um, with some dirt to simula simulate their environment. And I got this pane of glass from an old picture frame um, over top to keep them inside so they can't escape. I put 10 of those adult larvae in this arena along uh, I said adult larvae, adult ants, um, along with two larvae. And I took a video, you can see this video camera, I recorded for five minutes, it's kind of an arbitrary number, but I was consistent recording for five minutes so I could view it later and be more easy to observe what's happening because there's 10 different things to keep track of. Now I did that for three different conditions. I had an experimental condition where one of the larvae was large, one of the larvae was small, right? They would be of different size. And then my control would be that um, they were of the same size. They're indistinguishable as far as size. So control one would be there were two larvae that were five millimeters in length. That's the large variety. Or there could also be a control when I used two larvae that were both 2.5 millimeters in length. That's the small condition. Um, in between conditions, I would swap out the larvae, but I kept the same 10 ants. Um, that way you could see their behavior change. I didn't want to swap the ants for the conditions. Um, because I used the same 10 ants, I also wanted to kind of randomize the order in which I would do those three conditions. Sometimes I'd start experimentally with the different sizes. Other times I would start with the small versus small, and that way there was no order bias. Um, and then lastly, I would also clean it um, in between everything. Every trial, every condition, I was sure that I would clean, um, empty out the soil, and before I put new soil, I would use some ethanol to rinse it a bit. I would keep track and remove any pheromones, any alarm pheromones that might influence the ant behaviors when they were put back in. And I did try to do six trials. That would be about um, 18 total videos, right, with the uh, three conditions, six trials. I was only able to get 17 um, because I was unable to get enough larvae for one of them, for one of the trials. It was an incomplete trial. Um, I measured attention or attendance in two different ways. I looked at the number of touches that the workers gave to any individual larvae in a condition, and I also looked at the total number of seconds they spent, because I think it matters. You know, they could be, have a brief touch, but what if that touch lasted for a majority of the time? Um, finally, I did six t-tests, because among the two ways, the two responding variables and the three conditions, that's going to be, you're going to see six bar graphs, and I did 60 tests to see any significance. And I would hypothesize that my experimental condition 
would have significant difference and you would prefer the workers both in number of seconds and number of touches would prefer the larger larvae for reasons already explained. But then in my control conditions where the size was the same, I would expect no significant difference. So um, we'll see how that stacks up later. This is a little bit more of my methods. Here you can see in Arena, this is the type of video I would watch to actually get my data. This is an experimental condition. You see a large larvae on the right, small larvae on the left. Whenever an ant would come by, here's one. Initially, that ban, that's a touch. That would be one touch, even though it's touching it with its lifting and tickling it, there's a second touch from a second individual. But I did not discriminate between um, touches with antennae first or legs or mandibles. It all counted as a touch for me. Um, now this larvae, would, this would be one touch that is prolonged for several seconds. If this ant were to leave as the second one did, but come back, then that's the second touch, even though it's from the same individual. Um, as far as total seconds, I often found that um, larvae were in contact more often than not with the workers. So I found it to be uh, much more efficient to count timestamps and find the total second intervals where the larvae were completely isolated and alone. And then I would take 300 seconds, right? Five minutes, 300 seconds is the total. Subtract the intervals of seconds where they were completely alone. And the difference would be the total amount of time, total seconds that they were spent with workers actually touching them. So I did that for all 17 videos. I watched each one twice for each of the larvae and I got some results. Before I go into the nitty gritty of my three different conditions, let's talk a little bit about my master sums and these master averages. Here on the, oops, excuse me, on the left I have touches, on the right I have the total seconds. And this basically tells the story all the way across the board. But here I ignored my conditions. I didn't care which larvae was with which larvae, whether it was small versus small, large versus large, or if it was large versus small. I counted across all 17 small larvae tested. The sum was 150 touches about, which is an average of about nine touches. For the large, there were 17 large larvae tested. The sum of those touches was 300 about, whereas the average was about 18 touches. And that's almost double from small to large. And you see the same story in total seconds. Across all 17 small larvae, there's about 1,700 seconds. Across all 17 large larvae, there is about 3,400 seconds. And the average tells the same story. Of the 17, if you average it out, it's 100 seconds. But if you average for the 17 large larvae, it's about 200 seconds. That's really convincing that this size is playing some kind of role, there's some kind of correlation going on. Remember, it's not causation. This is just showing correlation. If we zoom in and take a look, this is a kind of a daunting figure, but trust me, it'll be easier to have them all lined up. Now my top row is showing touches, right? The y-axis is the same for all measuring average touches. Um, and here my bottom three bar graphs are all measuring the time. So the y-axis is always duration in total seconds. My columns are my conditions. Here, is the large versus small in the same here. The left column is my experimental condition. This middle column is the large versus large first control. And the right is the small versus small control. But is my hypothesis supported? Um, does it seem like there's a correlation and a preference for the large larvae over the small? Yes, I did the t-tests and you can see these two asterisks mean that the p-value was below 0.01 in both number of touches and total seconds. Um, that's what I expected to see. And as I explained earlier, let's look at the far right column with small versus small, both in touches and time. There was no significant difference between touches or time for the small 2.5 millimeter larvae. If there were looking at other factors, you might expect there to be a difference. You know, if there was some maternity going on, you might expect to see a significant difference if they were looking at um, if there's some other sexes, a different cast within those small sizes, you might see a significant difference, but that's not what we see. Um, the same case is happening here. Although these averages are a bit different, they were not significantly different for my large versus large when I was measuring touches. That being said, but also no. Here, this is something I didn't expect to see. When, even though this was not significant for the touches of my large versus large control, there was a significant difference between the duration spent. 
they seemed to be um, less inclined to spend time on the right side. I'm not really sure why, it might be coincidental. Um, so there might be a little bit of sidedness going on, but one thing I did mention is that I didn't think they'd pay attention to was the sex. Um, but we do know there are two different sexes of reproductive cast larvae, um, which is more often likely what these large ones are. So that could account for that significant difference. It's something that's interesting. Um, so let's talk about the problems. So here you can see this is where, um, I'm sorry, I keep clicking it. This is the small larvae. Um, now it's still possible that some small ones we're seeing could grow into size because they all start as the same sized egg. But it's more likely that all of the small ones I'm seeing are going to become these sterile female worker pupa. Whereas these larger five millimeter ones are going to become this reproductive cast. I don't know if this is male or female yet, but you can see wings forming. They're much bigger. I've never seen this in person as an adult. I never saw this in the wild, but this is only because I collected them later. Um, but yeah, some problems, sightedness might have played a role. I don't think in all cases, because it only happened in that one condition for that one measurement of the time spent, but not the touches. But still, there could be a size um, bias, side go bias going on. Um, and all those assumptions I outlined beforehand might be happening. Um, the biggest one being mixing of the cast. I know that for sure now they are not a type of ant that is going to discriminate or segregate larvae predetermined to become a different cast. They kept large and small together, sterile workers and reproductives together, um, which means you know, the, the, that would play a role. But also, the sex of these reproductives could also be accounting. Because if you look over here, there's never a significance between sterile workers because they're always going to be female. But when they were larger and reproductive, you might see a significant difference. And that's because you can have some that would be female and some would be male. Here are some uh, other three factors. I never did acclimation time. I put my 10 ants in and started recording right away. The reason for that was because otherwise I'd have to acclimate them without larvae. And to put the larvae in, I'd have to lift the lid and they might escape. But I need to find a way to acclimate because otherwise they might be behaving differently in this foreign arena. I also had incomplete trials as I explained. Um, I disturbed the nest too much one day when I was trying to get two trials and they hid all of the larvae in the tunnels. No matter where I would dig, I couldn't find them and that affected um, the sample size. I should also try to increase my sample size. I only had six trials. Um, lastly, I didn't do a good job controlling between whether or not I chose more opaque looking larvae or more transparent larvae. And as you can see here, that would play a role in developmental stage as well. The opaque larvae are closer to be becoming um, uh, more dormant and in a stasis mode to be pupa where they may not need as much attendance. They don't need the food, whereas the transparent ones might need more and might need more attendance. And so that's something to look into controlling as well. So I'm about to run out of time here, but there's so many future directions to take this. Um, as I mentioned, sightedness. I should take, um, use the same larvae and the same ten ants, do a trial and see if they preferred, say, the left side. And if I swap the larvae over, if I see them then start showing a preference for the right side, I know it's the same, and I use the same larvae, then I know they're, it's the larvae they're preferring. But if they still show a preference for the left side, that might mean that there's a side bias going on. It'd be a very simple experiment I could do. Something else to look at would be individual worker bias. Does one worker account for more touches than another? That would require, like, that would mean implies specialization. I'd have to look at um, anesthetizing ants, maybe painting them a different color to keep track, um, which I tried and would be very difficult with this ant species because they're so small. But I might be able to do that with maybe a genus Campanotus, a much larger tree dwelling ant that you could put paint spots on. Um, this figure here outlines, this is the assumptions I was making of sender related. There's also colony related and receiver related. I'm not gonna go over all of them, but the experience of the worker, the older they are, the more likely they are to be foraging workers, whereas the younger ones are more likely to be nurses. I would like a way to find that. Also parasites can play a role. I definitely saw these Myrmecophilus genus, um, ant loving crickets. They might also be affecting behavior and it'll be a good um, an interesting thing to look into whether or not their presence is affecting the worker behavior. Um, finally, that determining the sex of the larvae before testing them of those reproductives would be very important. And I need to do that without like destroying them, doing genetic results. So I found this great paper about a non-destructive method, and they looked at genital disc patterns. You could you could see it was very difficult and very hard to distinguish, but you could learn patterns. The problem was they didn't use my ant species and it, their methods required them to know the difference beforehand 
before they could see the differences. If I were to become an expert on genital discs, then maybe I could find out. So those are some future directions. Um, if you have any questions, um, let me know. I'm really passionate about this. E email me or Canvas comment maybe. Um, here are my references. Otherwise, thank you for listening to my presentation and thanks for a great quarter. Bye.